I'm Armander Turetkin. I'm the president of AUA. I'm very pleased that we have a special guest today uh, to give a, what proves to be, what, what will promises to be uh, a very interesting and timely topic. Um, Nubar, Nubar Afeyan is a founder, senior managing partner, and CEO of Flagship Ventures, a leading early stage venture capital firm. He also leads the firm's Venture Labs unit that invents and launches transformative startups. He's a senior lecturer at MIT Sloan School of Management, where he has taught courses on technology, entrepreneurship, innovation, and leadership since 2000. Dr. Afeyan has altered numerous scientific publications and patents since earning his PhD in biochemical engineering from MIT in 1987. He lectures widely in the United States and internationally on diverse topics ranging from entrepreneurship, innovation, and venture capital to, to biological engineering, drug discovery, medical technologies, and renewable energy. In addition, he serves on the board of Ameria Bank and UWC Diligent College uh, International School. Uh, of course, you all know that these are in Armenia. Previously, previously he was a co-founder and board member of the National Competitive Foundation of Armenia. Uh, and uh, in 2008, he received the Ellis Island Medal of Honor. This is a very distinguished uh, medal granted to outstanding Americans who have distinguished themselves as United States citizens and have enabled their ancestry groups to maintain their identities while becoming integral parts of American life. Uh, Nubar is one of those special individuals who uh, have this bug in them that they have to come back to Armenia and get involved in different projects. And I think you're all very fortunate that he has that bug. Uh, as you can see, he's involved in many projects. And I hope that uh, we will also infect him with the AUA version of that bug so that he comes back to AUA and gets engaged and uh, helps us with our projects and our endeavors. Uh, so I'm very pleased uh, to invite Nubar to talk about entrepreneurial innovations, transforming health and sustainability. Okay, now I wonder whether we should turn these lights, the front lights up, so the slides might look better. Okay, well, Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, it's actually a great pleasure for me to be here. I have actually given a couple of talks here before. Uh, some of you may have seen this 10 years ago. Uh, and, but the topic was, had nothing to do with anything I knew about, which was back then I was talking about the future of Armenia and economic development. And what I convinced the audience was that at the time, very few people knew much about that topic. So I wanted to get students encouraged to really get involved with owning the future of Armenia. Um, it's been a while since I came back. I must have had an effect. But today, I'm here to talk to you about something that I know a little better than that topic, only because this is what I do professionally. Uh, so I'm an entrepreneur and innovator, and I've been at it for 28 years. And, uh, and what I would love to tell you about is just kind of what that world is all about. It's a, it's a world that I think is a very much a part of Armenia's future. Uh, and, and, and I'd love to find ways to encourage all of you to find a way to be in that world one way or the other. So that's really my purpose here. I'm going to talk about a bunch of different things, so bear with me. Uh, I, since the audience is varied, I don't really know what interests you. And my, my goal is to try to make sure I talk about at least one thing that interests you. So when you see all this diversity of topics, it's, it's because I want to make it relevant to as many people as I can. So. Um, let me just kind of start up by just getting you to think a little bit. Think about the last 50 years, so for many of you, the life of your parents, uh, or some in the room probably can think back and say, What's, what do you think is the most impactful innovation during that time to society, to the world? And if you ask yourself that question, maybe some of you are thinking, I know, it's the computer. 
Because 50 years ago, the computer didn't really exist, at least if it existed, it existed in extremely clunky form. But others might be saying, surely it's cell phones, surely it's internet, Google search, electric cars that are now coming about, satellites, they didn't exist. Uh, in the biology field where I practice quite a bit, biotechnology didn't exist. There was really, there were very few drugs that did anything back then. Today there's several hundred billion dollars of drugs that all came about with new technology. On and on. And maybe there's some I'm missing here, so feel free to add it in your mind. I'm not going to quiz you. But I would like to suggest to you, just to kick us off and to set the mood, that the biggest single innovation in the last 50 years is the startup company. Now, you might find that weird, because you might have been thinking that an innovation has to be a technology. It doesn't. It could be a process. And I would argue that the startup company, more specifically, the fact that mere mortals, just regular people, can have an idea, dream about something that there's no proof for, attract capital, attract expertise, have the legal system that allows them to make money and keep that money, all of that didn't exist 50 years ago. And it's hard to fathom, I've been at this for 28 years, so when I was doing this in the beginning, people could tell me what it was like a decade earlier. I can tell you in 1987 when I started, there were maybe 10 new companies 15 new companies started a year, if that, in Boston. And Boston was a mecca. Now there's 10 new companies a day, maybe 10 new companies half a day. And in our lifetime, this whole innovation of the startup company has come to life. Now, why is that important to you? Well, first, I'm going to prove to you that my, my hypothesis is, is at least worth considering. Because whereas your answer might have considered the value created by just Microsoft, or Microsoft plus Apple, or, or you know, whatever, Tesla, I get to count them all. I get to count every single one of them. Because what they all share in common is that they are instances of a startup company, the innovation I'm talking about. So I, I hope, therefore, you'll at least think about this and say, well, what does that mean to me? Well, one of the things it should mean to me, to you, is that this is a very new phenomenon. And in fact, in the last 15, 20 years, really since the internet, is when this has become a scaled activity, at least in the US. Now, you might say, well, that's bad news. Well, actually, it's very good news, because everywhere else in the world where people think they are way, way behind, they're not way, way behind, because this didn't exist in this form even 15, 20 years ago in the US. This is really new. So that's a good thing, because that means that we're just learning about this field and about what makes it tick. And I think for countries like Armenia and many others, rather than trying to figure out how can I look like Silicon Valley 50 years ago, which frankly is what every aid organization tries to give people money to figure out, I think it's a waste of time. I think you should figure out how it's going to look like five years from now and build it now. Because it's all new and it's all changing. So with that as a preamble, let me kind of dive into it. And I'll change some topics as we go. One thing I want to say, this is not a slide I want you to read. It's just that I had a slide to remind me to say this is that when I'm talking about innovation, I'm talking specifically about technological innovation. Why? Because I don't know anything about the other kind of innovation. So technological innovation, whether it's a process or a product, it's still in the field of science technology. And in that field, there are basically three places this is practiced. The one that could produce most of our products till now, till recently, is corporate innovation. And corporate innovation, <coughs> large companies, medium-sized companies, is very specific in how it works, right? The, the main tenets of it is that there's a process, there's a plan, there's accountability, there's efficiency, there's a budget that somebody approves, and there's expectations for results. Contrast that to startups. There's hardly any plan, no efficiency, it's a very wasteful process, all trial and error. There's no predictability, and the result is highly innovative, radical, because nobody knew it was possible. So I'd like to suggest, and in the question and answer we can debate this, I'd like to suggest that basically, by and large, the entrepreneurial innovation system that I'm going to talk about and others can tell you about is the only way to make radical innovations. And the corporate system is the only way to make incremental improvements and optimization of existing innovations. But the notion that a large company could use what's called a stage gate process and a four-step market testing oriented approach to create something that nobody ever dreamt of before is simply not borne out in fact. And I don't say that here. I say that at MIT 
And across MIT, I can tell you there's a fairly substantial capitulation to that realization. And in fact, the hottest new area in MIT is basically revolutionizing innovation done in an entrepreneurial way as a system, as an engineering approach versus a, just an observation of what, you know, isn't it nice that there are startups in the world and we can celebrate them. So I'm saying a few things just to try to, for those of you who are expert in the area, to at least get you to think about this. By the way, academic innovation, which is in the middle, academic science-driven innovation is a third kind. And the, the characteristic of that is that it tends to be invention first, then looking for an application of the invention. By and large, that's a very unique type of innovation because you're basically not looking to improve your current products. You're not trying to create an entirely new category out of thin air, but you're basically trying to take the science that's being funded based usually on government money and trying to say, what's this good for? And it has its own idiosyncrasies. I'm not going to talk about that today much at all. Look, so let me switch gears and tell you kind of my small interaction in this area started out in 1987, in October 20. And I'm saying this largely because I was a graduate student, just like many of you are, and I had just gotten my PhD, and it was not a very typical thing to do. In fact, there's a friend here from Boston who's been living here for many years, Dikram and he'll remember in 1987 because we knew each other back then in Boston, and it was really not an environment where people did startups, let alone young people, let alone young people from overseas. It was a very kind of different field. You had to have worked for 30 years, and you had to be you know, named Bacon or Rogers or some American. I mean, it was a very, very e exclusive club. Uh, but I didn't know it was about to change. So I entered this field, and the reason the date is relevant, and the caption, by the way, here basically is kind of inviting the other uh, 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 to come out of the box and, and, and take some risk. The reason the date was significant is this date which is October 19, 1987. Now, many of you may not remember this, but October 19, 1987 was what was called Black Monday. And that was when the first time the stock market crashed ever since the Great Depression in the US. It had not happened in a couple of generations. And you might say, well, why, am I, why do I have to know this for this lecture? Well, the reason is because in my case, I started the day after this happened. Now, I was completely naive. I had no idea why a stock market crashing had anything to do with startup companies. But you realize immediately that the whole economy is interconnected. And for people to take the kind of crazy gambles on new technologies, they need to be doing well in other areas. And so the kind of volatility in markets that we experience affects startups in a big way. You learn that. Now, at the same time, you learn that if you get too scared of these kinds of financial turbulence, you probably shouldn't be in this field. So one of the things that I learned on day one, which has served me well till now, is basically assume that every single day is October 19, 1987. And you'll be more right than wrong, it turns out. Because this is, a, this is start, doing startups, you're going to hear me say this over and over again, is a highly volatile, highly unpredictable uh, activity. It's just that when it works, it's also highly exciting and thrilling. So the reward justifies the effort, but you would be kidding yourself if you thought, that you're getting into a, a predictable ride. It's just not. Let me skip ahead. So in my experience, the first company that I started, and I'm not going to tell you about a lot of these because I want to tell you about the current, the current and the future, hopefully. The first company I got involved in starting was, at the time, the very first attempt to make new instruments for the biotechnology revolution. You may know that 30 years ago, people started realizing that you could basically make the proteins that are in your body outside the body in little de in devices, like beer fermentation tanks, effectively, back then. And so you basically, people started creating the biotechnology industry. And there was no engineering, no systematic anything, and there was no uh, um, manufacturing technology. So I ended up getting, as an engineer, interested in developing new tools in that space. That's company, Perceptive Biosystems, basically for over a 10-year period, grew to reach about 110 million in revenues. We had about 900 people. And it ended up for that field, to become pretty successful in becoming a market leader in making a whole new generation of tools. And the slide I, I missed, just because it's not going to mean anything to you, except for those of you who work in the field, is all sorts of instrumentation. In particular, that company brought to the world, for the first time, mass spectrometry. So mass spectrometry in biology, not in chemistry, was pioneered by, this, by the group of scientists that I worked with. And that's what led to the company's growth. But more importantly, what I'm here to tell you about is it didn't stop there because from there, 
We actually developed another technology which spun out into a separate company called Chemgenics Pharmaceuticals. Then three other companies, uh, and let me show you what they do actually, maybe that'll make more sense. So the first was instruments, the second one was drug discovery, then Antigenic started in 1996, actually, you may know the name Garo Armin, who's a quite, quite an active uh, uh, Armenian philanthropist, uh, uh, the head of founder of Children of Armenia Fund, that's how you will have known him. He also can come and give you a talk if you'd like, because we were, he was the founder of Antigenics, we actually collaborated on this. One of the most thrilling things to do in the diaspora is to actually work in a professional setting with another Armenian, not because you're Armenian. And in his case, he is a world-class executive and entrepreneur, and we got to collaborate in Antigenics together. Exact Science is a diagnostics company. So I'm not going to be able to tell you about all these today, but the reason I'm putting this up is just to tell you that what I'm going to say is derived from not one instance. One of the things I always warn students about is that when people give you a talk based on their experience and it's an N of one, then you're just hearing a story because it's very hard to extrapolate when you've actually seen something once or done something once because as you know, as an engineer, one data point can fit any curve, right? So you could describe all sorts of things with just one point. It doesn't mean anything. So you have to, have, you have to see these things over a few cycles. Well, the, the fact is that in the 90s, this whole field was beginning to take off and one of the things that helped in that regard was that people were hungry for innovation. In fact, 25 years later, they're again hungry for this kind of innovation. I say that in passing because in whatever field you're in, you also need to keep in mind whether the world, by that I mean the large companies in the space or consumers, if that's what you're targeting, are expecting new innovations because their needs have gone way beyond what can be done today. Well, that was an interesting period for that. And all of these companies, it turns out, so there were six of them all together, went public or were sold or both. And that kind of set the stage for what I ended up doing since, which is probably the more interesting part of this talk, which is that I ended up finding myself in 2000, around the time I actually started engaging in Armenia, and I've met several of you in the audience back then, I was kind of beginning to think, what, what do you do with this? So if, if, if in one case it worked out, and then in a few other cases, but in different contexts, things also worked out, you know, I kind of thought, well, either I have to go around and tell people how lucky I am, or I have to try to figure out what about these things was worth repeating and see if there's a way to innovate how to start companies. And that's what I'm going to tell you about in about 10 minutes in the, in the kind of rest of my talk. But let me, in the beginning, just from this journey, try to see if I can draw, uh, derive a few kind of overall impressions about entrepreneurial innovation. Then I'm going to tell you about some actual new companies that have been born out of this new process we're using. And then I'll end with some conclusions. So, Hopefully we have enough time to get through all this. I'll try to accelerate uh, towards the end. So, so let me kind of, with this journey, the first kind of 18, 1987 to 2000 part of the journey, let me tell you kind of what my overall impressions were, uh, because I think they're generally useful for whether it's biotechnology or energy or water or, or whatever you're innovating, including IT, although I will say right up front that I'm no expert in applications or software development, so my comments may not apply to that field. My students who are, and a lot of times tell me that they are, but I don't want to claim any, any expertise there. So this is a slide that I think captures kind of what the startup world's about, right? So the caption reads, this could be the discovery of the century, depending, of course, on how far down it goes. And that the point there is to say that every idea that is born out of an entrepreneur's mind starts out be being a gigantic pyramid. Uh, but then again, once you start digging, it may not be. So you have to kind of keep that in mind. You don't, you want to... As an entrepreneur, I'd urge you not to take yourself seriously because you are venturing into a space where usually nobody's been before and the notion that you have better senses or better judgment or better intuition to guide you to where the value is, is a joke. And I know some of you are going to be here tomorrow listening to Patch Adams and he'll tell you a lot more about jokes, but it is, it is something, I just saw him a couple of days ago, is by the way, if any of you guys are not planning to come, you're crazy. You should come. You're going to get a far better talk with tomorrow's. I think it's tomorrow, right? When Patch is here, outstanding human being. But anyway, the point I want to make is there's a bit of clowning involved in doing startups in the sense that you don't want to take yourself seriously. Because in a way, I mean, think about what you're doing. You, have, you see something in your mind that could be valuable. You can't prove that it's valuable. You can't prove you could make it in a way that you can make profit. You usually don't know how you're going to make a lot of it. You don't really know the customer is not going to kind of say, well, I got a better version, so you're out. And yet, you're going to go ask people for money. 
You're going to get unsuspecting people to quit their job and you're your, you, you join your company? I mean, that's crazy, right? But, you know, it's good, but it's crazy. So I don't, I don't want people, at least from my standpoint, to take what they're doing so seriously that they actually think they're right. Now, this might depress some of you because you might be going around telling people you're right. I'm going to tell you why I'm saying this in a minute. Because it turns out that just because you don't know you're right doesn't mean you can't proceed. You just have to proceed in a different way, in a humbler way and in a more, I'd say, inquisitive way versus in an assertive way, which a lot of entrepreneurs get. But let me come back to that. Now, the word entrepreneur, for those of you who know French, know that it comes from the French word entreprendre, which means to undertake. It's quite ironic that the literal translation, therefore, is undertaker. Because, and of course, that's not the meaning, but if those of you who don't know what undertaker means, it's the person who presides over funerals. And that is just my way of reminding people that there's a lot of deaths in this field. And, 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 and among the things you want to very quickly get out of your system is the notion that if you do startups, you're going to succeed. I think what you want to tell yourself is that if you do startups, you will succeed enough if you get better at it and you're persistent at it. And you might luckily succeed the first time, but boy, would you be making a mistake if you thought that you were good because you succeeded the first time. Because that simply is not provable. And your attitude, if it changes, you'll lose a lot of money later for you and for other people. So there's a lot of failure in this field, but there's also the opportunity to match it, which we'll talk about. The second thing there is in this startup world, and I hope some of you who are in that world today will share that view, is that it is intense. This is, this is a photo maybe some of you have seen. You can see the moment. You can see the guy dangling from the helicopter. You can see there's a helmet bobbing in the water on the left side. You see that one? That one's in real trouble. <coughs> And this moment of, I'm not sure who's who, maybe the venture capitalist is the shark, or maybe the, 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 the main competitor is the shark, and, and the rest of you are. No. But the point is it captures the moment, I think, in the sense of it's intense, it's scary, and if you're in a startup and you feel scared, that's a good thing, because it's going to make you alert, and you're probably in the right space. If you're not scared doing a startup, you're not working on anything worth working on, in my view. Because that means that you have taken so much of the risk out, that you're working on something that's probably been already done before, or is really close to something that's already been done, and therefore I don't know how you can assume that there's huge value available. By the way, I'm telling you all these things like I know what I'm talking about. I warned you in the beginning, this is just my own opinion. We want to discuss this, but, but it it's also should be taken with a grain of salt. Now, there's a lot of myths in this field. I don't want you to read all this, but some of the things that are, that are highlighted is, you know, people believe that entrepreneurs are born, they're not made. They think it's in your DNA. Uh, they think that it exists more in some countries than others because they think that you have kind of the history. Uh, we can debate whether Armenians make better entrepreneurs than non-Armenians, etc. This is all kind of stuff out there. They also claim that entrepreneurs are gamblers. I know lots of entrepreneurs that are extremely risk-averse in their regular life, and yet there's this image that entrepreneurs are kind of crazy risk-takers, on and on and on. The point, the reason I'm putting all this up is Kind of what's been said about entrepreneurs, I think just describes the individual entrepreneurs that happen to be doing something. In other words, there's as many descriptions of these things as there are entrepreneurs. But in my experience, these are not generalities that actually work, because I can disprove these with many, many instances. Sufficient to say it's really not what, it, what in my view, these characteristics don't capture this. And in fact, to make that point, let me also show you that the photograph I showed you is not a real photograph. It was a photograph that was circulated on the internet back in the early 2000s time frame, by the way, and it took quite a long time, and National Geographic did this huge kind of expose and found the original stock photos in which they, people had made this hybrid picture. It was a picture of a military exercise off of Australia or New Zealand, I forget, and a photograph of a shark, completely unrelated picture. But the point I'm making is that there's a lot that you think you see in entrepreneurs and innovators and what it's all about, I just ask you to take it with a grain of salt. So, with that in mind, let me just say a couple of other generalities and dig a little bit deeper. So, at a high level, if you're going to deal with an, a technology kind of innovation and being an entrepreneur in that world, you're usually thinking about four dimensions. One, something that's technically possible. Usually it hasn't been done before, so you have to estimate, is it going to be possible to do this? The second is that it's desirable to a large or growing market. Sometimes a growing market gets you enough pull to exist. Otherwise, if it's a small and not growing market, then, then why would they take the risk of innovation? So those are not places where people tend to go. The third is 
can you actually propose a product or a service that you could deliver and make money doing? Most entrepreneurs, usually first-time entrepreneurs, don't consider this dimension at all because they don't usually imagine a product. They imagine a capability, and they imagine that magically this new capability based on new technology is going to get transferred to the customer, and they're going to pay them a lot of money for it. But unless you can say which product or which service is the customer actually going to acquire to derive this value, I wouldn't go forward. And the other one is protected. It can be protected. So this is one where, this is the one main area where portions of the IT business deviate from just about every other kind of technology innovation because patents don't really apply. I work in fields where patents apply. And where patents apply, I think it's foolish not to try to protect oneself, especially if you're trying to pioneer a new area, because it's really easy for a large company to see what you're doing and then outspend you, outbrand you, out intimidate you, drop the price, do everything they can with their customers to kick you out. Your only protection at the end of the day is if you can bring them to their knees. And I'll give you an example. In my case, the company I didn't say much about, a company called Color Kinetics, was the very first LED-based lighting company. It was started in Boston by a couple of young scientists. I happened to get involved in them in 1997. So I'm talking about these LED lights. You may have seen some of them around here. They're much more popular now. Well, back in 97, these guys had the idea that little LEDs, colored LEDs, could be used with a microprocessor to get any, any additive color you want. So you could create any color light based on this approach of, of a kind of an intelligent electronic device coupled with LEDs. Well, you might say, what's the big deal? Who wants color lights? Well, what ensued was a whole slew of patents that we fought, and it ended up being 100 different patents. And then, as the company developed, LED markets started to become everybody's interest. And in 2007, Philips, Philips Electronics, which actually is now the light, largest lighting company, could not sell LED lights in the US without exposing itself to a whole slew of patents. And finally, they bought the company. They bought the company for $800 million. That was 10 times revenues. Nobody pays 10 times revenues for uh, the potential of the market. They pay 10 times revenues because there was a IP lock, a patent lock, that they figured it's going to cost a lot of time and money to break. And they might as well just bring it in and make life harder for others. So patents are also very important in this area. Now, when you look at this chart, and if you're sitting there with your own idea and say, boy, I'm not really sure the technology will work. I'm not really sure the market's big enough. What do I do? Good news is nobody knows these things on day one either. The reason I put this up, though, is you should accurately figure out which areas you know more or less about and spend your initial money and time trying to de-risk things in these dimensions. So for example, if you already have really good patents because you've worked with a university, they already got patents, whatever, or you're licensing it from another company, then I wouldn't spend much time in the beginning trying to f convince myself that I can protect it because you already have a relative advantage. But if I don't have a prototype or if I don't really know customers will value what I'm saying, I'd rather spend time on that. So the idea is, what would you do in the first six months, 12 months to get as close to the middle as you can? That's a learned skill that I would say you should at least think about. The other thing that I'd say, I could go on and on, I won't, but is life in these startups. Now this is, you know, it's, it's good to put these up. Some of you who are kind of like entrepreneurs today might, might resonate with this. I don't know, it's like Alcoholics Anonymous, I guess. It's like Entrepreneurs Anonymous, where you show each other pictures. Um, this picture is not made up. This picture is from when they were building the Sears Tower in Chicago. And the reason I put that up is to make people realize that for those guys who worked on that construction job, this is like 100 stories up or however many stories up, they're actually having a coffee break. They're not afraid at all. They're not afraid of that because that's their workplace. For you, it might seem unbelievably scary and you know, life-threatening. And by the way, if you're an entrepreneur, most of your family and friends and your parents will tell you, stop doing it, get a real job, you're crazy, you're going to hurt you. People will give you lots of advice. It's because this is how they perceive it. They don't work there, right? They don't work on that ledge. But as entrepreneurs, you work on that ledge. So you have to kind of realize what's perception-driven input you're getting versus what your world is like. Let me skip ahead and make two other general points. I'm sorry, this is all kind of stuff that I can talk a lot more about, but I want to make it more interesting and tell you some actual projects. Um, there's a bunch of things that people say about the kind of what it takes to, to, to at least make progress as an entrepreneur. I didn't say succeed, but to make progress. And there's a combination of communication and selling capability you need, listening capability you need, anticipation capability, leading, 
on and on. But the thing I want to actually maybe tell you a little bit about is the thing on the right. So I, I often get asked and, and also talk to a lot of other entrepreneurs about kind of how they would describe their mindset. And over the years, the, the best I could find in, in capturing it is really paranoid optimism. So you might say, what a tortured state that is, right? And it is. It is a tortured state. So when you're paranoid, you actually don't believe a whole bunch of things you're being told. And you don't even believe your own facts. And that, that makes you alert. That makes you suspicious. That makes you constantly poised to change your assumptions. And those are all good things in this space. Why? Because think of yourself like an explorer. You're in a completely new landmass. Nobody lives there. If they live there, they probably have arrows. They can shoot, can shoot at you. You've never seen an arrow in your life. And boy, is paranoia helpful as a survival skill. And so I would say that's vital. The problem is that if you're only paranoid, you'll depress yourself and you'll stop doing it. And that's kind of a lot of people who think about being an entrepreneur and they don't want to be it, get trapped with that. So the other part you need is just unabashed optimism. You want to basically constantly be seeing the world a better place than it is. And if you can manage to keep both of those mindsets, whether they're in your own head or in your team, kind of vital and protected and encouraged, however tortured you feel, I would argue you're in a good place to find the right answer. And I'll tell you why I mean this in a second, because I fundamentally believe that this startups and innovation is kind of an evolutionary process. And in an evolution, you've got a survival kind of threat. You constantly could be dead, but you're trying to overcome that. But you kind of constantly are looking for a better solution. It's an optimization approach. And paranoid optimism, in my view, captures that. And the last one of these series I'll put up, which should be, if you, you know, I don't advise people getting tattoos, but if you're going to get a tattoo, this is a completely adequate one. Um, in the sense that I think this captures kind of the, the life of a entrepreneur, particularly in the startup, kind of technology startup space. Again, I'm, I should make sure you understand, I'm not talking about entrepreneur in the broadest sense of the world. I'm not talking about entrepreneur who maybe privatizes a public company or spins out a big company. I'm talking about yesterday there was nothing, today there is extremely little, but you're now seeing forward to the day where there's going to be Uber or Google or whatever. That, that's the thing. And this, this is kind of very often your state, which is you might not know how to get out of a situation, but boy, do you try to figure out how to lock that situation for a little while until you could figure it out. And that, that struggle is an existential struggle. Okay, so let me kind of tell you a little bit now about what I've been doing in, with all this as, a, as, as, a, as experience, kind of what, how to put that to work. So uh, about 15 years ago, I kind of went, went on an experiment with a bunch of other folks by that time who I had worked with. And the idea was, and this Venture Labs part is what I'm going to tell you about, was could we take all these hypotheses, because that's all they are, they're hypotheses, I can't prove them. And could we actually think about innovating as an entrepreneur in a more systematic way? Now, you could blame me for this because I'm an engineer by background, and I kind of want to, and engineers usually want to systematize what it is that they do, if they can. And in this case, I kind of refuse to believe that 100 years from now, people are going to start companies the way they did 20 years ago, which is this kind of cottage industry, and romantic and chaotic, and people making movies when it succeeds. I mean, that's a really bad way to go for society, because that guarantees all sorts of waste of money while people go on <laughs> on crazy, crazy ideas. You want to say, OK, well, yeah, we can take risks, but where can we mitigate this risk, and how can we learn? So, this is kind of what we do. So let me tell you, you know, this is going to change themes a little bit. So what we have done in the last 15 years is to basically set up a lab whose purpose it is to create kind of unprecedented companies. So the idea is these are all innovations that didn't start in academia. They didn't start in a company. They're basically, they basically were, happened by virtue of approaching a white space a place where there really is no technology, no preconceived need, no real product, and no protection. So you might say, how can you, how can you innovate there? Well, w the way we've approached it is by starting out on the left by creating hypotheses for ventures. So a venture hypothesis, just like a scientific hypothesis, 
basically is a initially a fictitious kind of assertion that a technology that you can describe but has never really been shown can produce this product that will deliver this value to this customer so you can make some money and you can protect it. That's a hypothesis. Now, in a brand new space, and I'll give you some examples of these in a second in case you're saying, what is he talking about? In a brand new space, it turns out you can come up with lots of hypotheses because they don't have the, the burden of being viable. They just have to be you know, plausible. So what we do is we actually populate a, a, an emerging space with a bunch of hypotheses. And then we engage in this iterative process that, for lack of a better word, I could only describe as Darwinian. Right? And we'll come back a little bit talk about that at the end. But you know, I don't know how much people here think about Darwinian evolution as a process as opposed to a religious concept. I, I'm not talking about it as a religious concept. I'm talking about it purely as a process, which is variation, selection, and iteration. If you take those three operators, variation, Take something, you make many versions of it. Selection, you put pressure so that some of them have to survive and the other ones can't, in some dimension. In the regular, in the natural world, it's basically you constrain resources and things compete for resources and whichever ones can get the resources and reproduce themselves, win. And whichever don't, go extinct. Selection. But then the key is neither one of those two things alone. It's iteration. You have to be able to reproduce enough so that the idea that gain an advantage can produce progeny, which in turn can compete again. And by those cycles, we humans call it trial and error. Well, it's not really trial and error if you think about it methodically. You can arrive at something that is a lot better than when you started. Well, that's kind of what I would suggest to you is a way to think about innovation and entrepreneurship in a brand new space. So that's what we've done. And I'll give you some results from this, and we can have, have, happy to talk more detail. But basically, the idea is you start with hypotheses, you engage with a broad community, hopefully, that you have access to. In our case, we have a great community of academics, other entrepreneurs, experts in the field, non-experts in the field. So you might say, why do you want to engage with these people? And why would you give them your idea? Well, the answer is, since our ideas aren't worth anything, because they're just made up hypotheses, it turns out that if you expose these made up hypotheses to experts, guess what they like to do? Let's take a think about it. If I came to you and I kind of told you that I'm going to take some new found material and I'm going to put it together with another one and I'm going to make a device that's going to kind of measure the temperature in this room and predict how many people are in it. I just made something up, right? Now, if I told Aram this issue, he has pretty much good knowledge of materials and how they combine and how far a gap it is from predicting the, how many people in the room for the temperature, then he might say, that, that'll never work and here's a reason why, right? So if you take nothing away from this talk, let me just kind of pause and just get you to think about one thing. When you're thinking about a brand new thing in a brand new area, it turns out that you need the help of, a, of, of kind of the crowd. Think of it as you know, wisdom of a crowd. You've probably heard about this. But you need them in a different way. You don't need them to give you a good idea. You need them to tell you how bad your idea is. And it turns out that most people love telling other people how stupid their idea is. I think it's the second, I think beyond the sun, it's the second most renewable, free, abundant resource on the planet. <laughs> Try it. And by the way, in a university, it's an extreme sport, right? So here it's taught, right? Because you measure yourself based on your expertise. Well, so if you go and ask an expert based on a bad idea, what do they do? They correct your idea, they tell you how stupid it is. Now here's another key secret. You can't do this and not be humble because you'll feel like an idiot. You'll feel like a clown, right? Because when you, so you have to be willing to dare to put forward a hypothesis in a space that you're no expert in in order to elicit an expert in that field to now collaborate with you by doing what they like to do, which is tell you how stupid your idea is. So they get something out of it. But now here's the last trick. You then have to also be smart enough, creative enough, resourceful enough, whatever it is, to iterate your idea to overcome that objection. And then you go to the next person. That next person could be another expert, or could be something completely away from the field. Because sometimes, if you only talk to experts, you'll get very limited points of view. Well, this is what we do for a living, by the way. This is, not a, this is not a theory. This is what we've done for 15 years, 20 people I have doing this for a living, and we've started 30 companies this way. I'll show you four of them. 
trust me, you, you, people can do this. They don't yet. Why? Because people get insulted when people tell them how stupid their idea is. Well, guess what? The idea I just told you about, about predicting how many people are in the room with a temperature of some... How can I be insulted? I just made it up. What does it mean to be insulted based on something you just made up? Well, but, so if you're humble, but also you're creative and you just want to keep iterating, my prediction is you'll come up with a really good idea. And you know how you know? The seventh person you talk to, they won't know what's wrong with your idea. They won't believe your idea because there's no proof yet, but they cannot tell you what's wrong with your idea. And when they can't, it's really worth going into a lab and trying to make something out of it, and not before that. Because usually, at that point, you've now gotten a whole bunch of people who could have killed it. They, the, the next one, the next one after that, they don't know what's wrong with it. So you might find it a little bit silly, and you might find it kind of totally esoteric, that's fine, but I'm trying to get especially the students in the room to think about it. Well, so using this process, as I mentioned quickly in passing, we have launched 30 different companies in the last 15 years. And, and, and those companies have all kind of gone on to be interesting pioneers. Some of them have succeeded, some have not, because it, just creating a company and launching it and getting it to a certain place does not guarantee ultimate success. But it does demonstrate the ability to get born, to get resources, to get partners, etc. So let me tell you a couple of these, for those of you who might be interested in, 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 in actual kind of ideas in the company space. This is, these are all very, very new companies, so I don't expect anybody would have heard about these. Here's one, a company called Moderna. And what this company ended up doing after this long exploratory process is to realize that while there are drugs in the market that are based on proteins, mRNA, those of you who took, I hope there are experts in the room, but those of you who are not, this is kind of the part of biology that probably was drilled into you, which is that DNA in our cells codes for mRNA, the mRNA copies little pieces of DNA, and that's the message that the body makes proteins with, and proteins basically make the action happen. So just about everything that's wrong with you involves proteins. The DNA may pre predispose you for that, but in a simplistic way, that's the proteins where a lot of the drugs action is. Well, this, this group basically uh, decided to, to, to kind of play with the idea that maybe there's a whole new drug category. Now, unfortunately, with time, I'm not going to tell you all the hypotheses that were generated and all the iterative loops that got here, but I'll show you the end result because it was completely out of left field in the pharmaceutical industry. Nobody had done this before, and I would contend nobody would have done this, <coughs> but for the fact that when we started, we didn't know any better, and therefore we allowed ourselves to think that you could make drugs out of these, and after a whole bunch of experts told us how crazy we were, we overcame their, expression, their, their objections, went to a lab, and this is what we did. So basically, here's what happens. You can look forward to it, I hope, in the next three, four, five years, hopefully there'll be drugs of this kind, or at least you'll hear about them being tried in the lab, So what, or in, in, in the clinic. This, the top left thing is usually the way one describes a piece of mRNA. mRNA usually codes for one protein. The protein could be insulin. You've all heard of insulin for diabetes. It could be growth factor. You've all heard that different diseases suffer from the lack of growth factors and dwarfism, for example, many others. You could hear about EPO, a drug that causes your red blood cells to grow, and that's a very important drug. Just about every cancer drug that's modern is made out of what's called monoclonal antibodies. They're all proteins. Well, it turns out that there's a code for every one of these. And whereas today, and in the last 30 years, the industry in biotechnology makes these things in these big, giant vats in very expensive processes, it turns out that every cell in your body knows exactly how to take a piece of mRNA and make a protein out of it. All we needed to do is to figure out how to get the mRNA in your body safely and trick the cell into believing that it should just do what it does with every other piece of mRNA. And that was not a minor feat, but take it for granted that that was the innovation that we had to make. Because in order to make mRNA a drug, we had to make some inventions. But we didn't start with those inventions. We first convinced ourselves that there was nothing wrong with mRNA. In fact, it would have been a huge idea if only you could make it into a drug. So what I'm showing here, just very quickly, is that the idea would be you would basically have this mRNA, which is a chemical, by the way. It's not a biological in the sense that it's not made in cells, it's not made with viruses, it's not with any of that stuff. There's no recombinant DNA technology. It's a bunch of chemicals stuck together chemically. You basically <coughs> stick it into a patient. The patient's cells make the protein that they're deficient in, and now they have a cure. Whatever the drug is. So imagine for a second how crazy it sounded when we went around and told people, what if you could make any drug in a patient? So you work on it in the lab, and we stick the RNA into the patient, the patient makes their own drug. 
too good to be true, so people basically believed that couldn't be done. Where are we so far? Well, just to give you some pictures to kind of wake some of you up who, who probably found the rest too esoteric, you might find this gory. But anyway, the way you do drug development is basically you first try it in animals. So what this data is showing you is that in a mouse, we took very, this all happened, by the way, in the last two and a half, three years. This is completely new. And there's no academic science behind this. The people were not working on this uh, in, in, in the basic science world. So what this is showing is that when we put in this purple color, EPO, some of you may see it as white or gray, I don't know what this color code is now, but um, if you take EPO RNA, that's what the purple, you see the, a significant amount of that being made in the mouse, that's what the purple is compared to the background. And you might say, so what? Well, the next thing you have to ask is, does that EPO work? It's a, this is a very complicated protein. And we're telling the mouse to make the human version of the EPO just by putting in a chemical code, and sure enough, it does that. So this, what you're seeing is the effect of the EPO, well-known biological effect. So you could show that if you put some of it, you get some, and you put a lot of it, you get more. That's good news. The next thing you have to say is, it turns out we're not really trying to cure mice, um, although the mice want us to cure them. Uh, but then you have to ask, you know, on the way to humans, you have to test it in bigger and bigger animals. And so you do this in rats, and you do this in non-human primates, chimps. Um, by the way, it's showing this because you may never see a talk again that has pictures like this, so I figured I'll tell you what that whole world that you've avoided all your life is all about. Uh, one interesting thing is that on the chart below, what it's showing is that regardless of the size of the animal, provided you make, you adjust the amount of mRNA to match the amount of blood in the, in the circulation of that animal, you get the same amount of the drug. And that dotted line coming across is what you needed to see the effect of the drug. So, for example, and this is a log scale. So you're looking at something on the order of 70 compared to 7,000. This is three orders of magnitude more than the drug you needed to make. You can easily do this. And we are doing this now going forward. Another thing just to see the effect of this, this is kind of a little gory, but I'll tell you how one derives value from this. Um, a, by the way, if you're thinking, why can't you do all sorts of drugs around this? That's what we're trying to do. So we went after, for example, heart attacks. So it turns out that it's known that in heart attacks, a piece of the heart muscle is dying, and there are what's called stem cells. Stem cells are there to regenerate. They make new stuff in your body. And it's been known in, in biology that a protein called VEGF could stimulate stem cells to kind of regenerate the heart muscle. Okay? So just take that part for granted. Well, what we did is we took VEGF, the mRNA coding for VEGF, and we injected it into mice right after we give them a heart attack. I know it's a little cruel, so I hope the mouse lobby is not here today. But, but they help save lives. It's just as simple as that. They do help save lives. So basically, the experiment here was done in Karolinska Institute and Mass General Hospital, was basically taking, taking the mRNA, sticking it into a mouse, into the heart through a catheter, and basically, the mRNA gets taken up by the cells. They make the protein. The protein works. And the way you know it works is that in red, are the number of mice that survive. Typically, within a few days after this heart attack, a day or two, all the mice die. There's no, nothing you can measure after a few days. In this case, 60% 60, 60, uh, of them survive 360 days after, which is miraculous for the mice. And that drug is being taken forward by AstraZeneca, a big UK company. So that's one example. So I'm not, you know, let me give you one, a couple of other quick ones, and then I'll try to wrap up looking at time. Another interesting frontier in biotechnology that we've been completely kind of exploring with this new type of innovation approach involves the human microbiome. How many of you have heard of the word microbiome? Raise your hand. Wow, very few. Four, three. All right, you're in for a treat. Uh, the ones who know what microbiome is hopefully know what, what I'm saying. So you might get something out of this, remembering this, because all this stuff is going to be you know, more and more, I think, talked about in the future. So it turns out that in our guts in the digestive system, particularly in the small and large intestine, the lining of the gut is filled with bacteria, right? You knew that, probably many of you knew that. And the medical profession knows that because once in a while it causes inflammation, it pokes a hole through your gut, and it goes into your circulation, and you get infected. That's how they know that these things are there. Plus, they know that it helps in digestion in some magical way. But people have not studied this at all. The reason they haven't is because there's thousands of different bacteria. Because you, 
kind of wash your hands, but not that much. And you eat food that's not sterile. And so it turns out that the bacteria in your gut are very, very variable and different between people. Now, you might say, why am I telling you all this? A few years ago, we had the technology for the first time to actually sequence, look at what these bugs are. And then ask the question, how is it different between people? And ask the question, what happens when you get sick? And what happens when you take antibiotics? And the answer to all those questions were completely unknown five, six years ago. This is a completely new field. Now, we got interested in this field at, at the Venture Labs group because we said, well, while people are going to figure all this out, we don't want to wait that long. Is there something we could do with this? And we talked to all sorts of people. We had all sorts of ideas about maybe the bacteria are making kind of chemicals that help your health. Maybe we could find them. Maybe we could find the bacteria in your stool. Sorry for kind of gr grossing you out. And you could make diagnosis of disease that way. So if you're going to have some kind of uh, digestive disease, you could find the bacteria that can tell you. All of those hypotheses we chased down. The one that was the most remarkable, if you're ready for this, crazy hypothesis, actually came when we went to experts and they told us, this is a really bad idea, but you ought to go talk to Dr. X. And in this case, Dr. X was a bunch of doctors who unbeknownst to the scientific community has been treating a disease called Clostridium difficile. So this is a bacterial infection, it's awful, in the gut. The only way you get it is if you go to the hospital and they put you on antibiotics for a few weeks. And then what happens is you get this infection and it causes diarrhea that cannot be stopped. And 20,000 people, 25,000 people a year in the United States die from this infection. It's the fastest growing, most prevalent hospital-borne disease there is, hospital-borne infection. Now, you might be saying, what does this have to do with what you're saying? Well, I'm about to tell you. It turns out that a bunch of doctors have realized that if you take, and I know I'm going to shock you now, <laughs> patch out of store is not going to be this long. Uh, if you take stool, stool, can you picture this? Fecal matter from a donor patient and you transplant it into people who are going to die from this disease, immediately the day after they're cured. And people have been doing this quietly, for reputational reasons, for years. They had no idea why it's working. They didn't really care that much. They had an idea that it's probably doing something to the bacteria. No science behind it. No regulation. No measurement systematization. It just worked. So we went around the world and talked to doctors who were doing this. They knew each other quietly. And we said, what the hell are you doing? And this was in 2010. And sure enough, around the time all this science was coming, so we came up with the hypothesis that what these guys might be doing is basically transplanting, sorry, let me just build this thing out, transplanting one type of ecosystem in the gut that has emerged when the antibiotics completely changed the health of the bacteria that are normally there, to another state where now this C. difficile gained an advantage, just like in nature, where bacteria and other organisms compete, and now it will not let the healthy ones come back because it's taken over. And that if you could somehow replace those bacteria with a healthy set of bacteria, it should work. Well, you might say, well, great, it's working already, who cares? It turns out that stool transplants, fecal transplants, are not a good business long term. No pharmaceutical company is going to easily go to the FDA and say, here's my product for you. Uh, so we basically, this wasn't that big a leap, by the way. We basically said, well, what if it turns out, surely you don't need thousands of bacteria from the donor. Maybe there's a small number. And we chased that idea, chased the idea, chased the idea, to basically find out that with about 15 of these different bacteria, and maybe it's 10 we only need, but we didn't really care, 15 of these together, could, re could recapitulate, reproduce the exact same thing as a fecal transplant. The only advantage is with the 15 or so, you could put it into a pill. You don't have to get it from a fecal transplant. You can put it into a capsule, take it orally, and it's completely cured. We then went into humans who were dying. This is now a year ago. And in 30 patients tried it out, 29 of them completely recovered. The one that didn't recover, uh, which is, by the way, better than the fecal transplant. I should have said, fecal transplants work about 75, 80% of the time. It's not really 100% of the time. But basically, 29 out of 30 was a big deal. So now we're testing it in human trials. More to come there because I should tell you that there's a lot of data that suggests that <coughs> obesity. So if you look at the gut, uh, the gut microbes in obese versus lean people, obviously care about that, completely different ecosystem. You cannot, rec you cannot describe. In fact, if people in mice have done this, you can transplant the bacteria from a 
obese mouse to a lean mouse within a week, they're obese. It's nothing to do with what they eat. Very strange. No, I mean, it's been reproduced dozens of times. It turns out that it has huge effects on mood. It has huge effects on neurological diseases. have been well de documented now. So there's going to be a lot of action. Think of it this way. We live, humans live, with an organ inside our guts that has more cells than the human body of different types. And there's 10 times different DNA in the bacteria that live with us than in our own cells. So you know how people freaked out when we sequenced the human genome and they declared to the world we have broken the code of humanity? Well, guess what? Without the code of these bacteria, which are 10 times more genetically diverse than humans are in terms of their gene content, we haven't figured any of that out. Because if you take bacteria out of the human gut, sterilize them, they'll die. They cannot digest food. 20% of the chemicals in their circulation come from these bacteria. It's a profound part of our life. It's an organ. And we didn't know anything about it until recently. So why am I telling you all this? All of that came after the fact. Because we tried to say, well, surely there's got to be something we can make in this area. And stay tuned, because this company might do a little bit of interesting things there. While we're at it, let me tell you just in passing one quick other example. Very, I'm going to superficially skim through this. This is the fun part about innovating kind of in a reproducible way because you start, you go after one thing and then people start saying, wait a minute, why aren't we also doing this? So in this case, at the same time as this was happening and we were realizing how vital these bacteria are, part people in our group said, you know what? Are bacteria also doing the same thing in plants? Now, all of you who took high school biology learned words, symbionts and uh, symbiosis and you know, all this stuff in the roots and how fun fungal and bacterial organisms in the roots give nitrogen and carbon and there's this beautiful ecosystem biology people study, right? And then you forgot about it. Well, it turns out that that's known, but what's not known is that inside plants, inside plants are hundreds of different bacteria. And when they make seeds, they put a few of them into the seed. And if you take those, those few out, as humans have done over generations of breeding corn and wheat and soybean, then those are very sick seeds, which then they've tried to improve with genetic engineering because they're sick seeds. And all of that was a hypothesis that some of our group basically said, went around telling people, and they said, you're out of your mind. And they probably were half right. Except what came out of it is this little project. It's about a year old. And what we have now shown is, in fact, just that, that there are in the endosphere, what's called, not in the roots, not on the outside of leaves, but inside the plants, organisms that are vital to its health. And the proof points, very easily, is we've isolated a whole bunch of them. And we've added them back, back to the seeds. And when you add them to a corn seed, we've seen 10, 15% increases in yield, in drought tolerance, in a bunch of other features. In fact, we are not doing anything special, the bacteria have co-evolved with these plants for millions of years, and they have the same relationship with these plants as we have with the organisms in our own gut. In fact, curiously, a lot of those bugs are also in our gut, because we've been eating those crops for a long time, and we haven't been sterilizing them and washing them or anything. That's how they got there to begin with. So it's an interesting kind of field. We have, we have isolated from all over the world organisms that uniquely cohabitate with these plants, and we're adding them back in, and we're seeing some pretty interesting results. The most further along, we've done field trials for three seasons now. On average, water use efficiency, nitrogen use efficiency, we've been seeing some pretty interesting uh, improvements. And in that world, you kind of look at the physical result. You're not going to see this very well. Look at the bottom right. You know, so on the left side, without the seed treatment, just regular high-end corn, but in drought conditions, you get these little pieces of corn. And just by adding a single bacterial species to the seed, the same exact thing, you get dramatic improvements, etc. So, um, you know, in the interest of time, I'm going to try to give you, you know what, let me skip. So those of you who are interested in energy, I'm going to skip this, although it's a great, it's a great promising project. Uh, Armin, how much, how are we on time? When do you want me to wrap up? I don't want to, well, people, by the way, I won't be offended if you leave, so feel free if you're if you get sick and tired of it. I, have, I teach class every week, so if some of you have to go, feel free. But I'll, I'll, I'll try to wrap up in another seven minutes. How's that? And we can have time for questions. Um, so very briefly, a fourth project just to tell you the diversity. Um, we got interested in a big problem in the world, and that is 
um, carbon CO2 emission. And everybody's worried about CO2 emission. But the problem is the way they're going about doing it is not making anything useful out of it. It's to bury it underground or to prevent it from being made like using electric cars. And all of that is great, except the planet makes a lot of CO2. So we got interested in one of these hypothesis-driven explorations to say, what could you do with carbon dioxide that could actually add value back? And so those of you who know thermodynamics and will know that that's a pretty crappy starting material to do anything with, because it's in a totally oxidized state, and you're going to have to put energy to do anything useful with it. Well, it turns out that there's a pretty cheap source of energy out there. It's called sunlight, and I'll come back to that. But those of you who are not taking seriously carbon dioxide, greenhouse gas emissions, and just basically global warming, we can have another debate if you want. I'm not a, a peacenik or, or an environmentalist or anything, but there is no scientific support for the notion that this is not having a huge negative effect on the planet. None. So anybody who's doing that should also be advocating that smoking is good for you. No, I don't want to offend anybody, that, but it's just the scientific data is very, very strong. But nothing can be done about it because we're all addicted on, on oil and we're all addicted on gas and on coal and we're not gonna accept a life without lights and without heat, so too bad. And our grandchildren will certainly wanna do something about it, but then it'll be too late. So with that as my soapbox, I apologize. Let me tell you what we've been trying to do. This is, very, this is a long-term project. No short-term satisfaction out of this, but let me tell you what it was about. And it's, to my knowledge, the only effort of this time. There's no, we have not been showered with lots of academic company because I think this was kind of something that could only be done industrially. So we basically have taken what is combustion, which many of you will remember, is you take a fuel, hydrocarbon, you add oxygen. Basically, you, 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 what that produces the combustion process is water, carbon dioxide, and energy. That's what, that's what happens in your car, that's what happens in all sorts of combustion uh, processes. And we are completely addicted to this process. Our cars mostly run on this, our factories run on this, CO2 is produced everywhere. So it turns out that if you think carefully about what a plant does, right, a plant, or the word photosynthesis that you probably learned, but you didn't really think of it maybe this way, is exactly the reverse of that. The only problem is it doesn't make a fuel. It makes a plant. So it makes corn, it makes wheat, but it doesn't make a fuel. Now people, as you know, have tried taking biomass and converting it into fuel. And there's a growing industry of people who are trying to do that. The problem is that that's multiple steps. And we can discuss the, the, the appropriate use of biomass and land. But let me tell you the, the alternative we're trying to do, which is we started asking the question, since we know there is life forms that can take carbon dioxide and make it into something. Could we get those life forms? It's photosynthetic, it turns out in our case, bacteria that exist in the ocean. And could we actually make them make a fuel? What fuel? Ethanol or diesel. And we started in 2008 down this journey, and we have exactly done that. We've basically taken photosynthetic organisms that do the same process of what a tree does, photosynthesis, but except we have added to it the genetic elements needed to take what they make inside of them to make more of themselves and instead convert it into a fuel and spit it out. And that's what the process is that Juul, this company, has been developing. More specifically, if you're in the biochemistry field, you will like seeing these kinds of charts. Basically, we take the organism, and you see that left X sign? We basically can genetically switch off its ability to grow. So for us, the organism can, cannot grow. It just becomes a catalyst. It becomes a little bag, nano factory of catalyst. We then add these steps at the top, the dotted blue lines, and that converts it into ethanol, or the green one that makes it into diesel and spits it out. And in fact, this is not just an idea. There's a plant in New Mexico, which we operate, where in these plastic devices, these, by the way, are not algae, and we're not growing algae. We're not growing anything. We're actually doing a continuous conversion of carbon dioxide into a fuel. And so it really is the reversal of combustion. We take water. We take energy from the sun, and we take carbon dioxide, exact reversal, and we produce a fuel. Sorry, we don't take water, so let me just here. Let me go there. Uh, we produce oxygen, and we produce a fuel. So yeah, we take water, CO2, solar energy, we produce fuel, we produce oxygen. So where are we on this? It turns out it's a lot longer road than even we hoped for. There's a lot of benefits from this, if this can happen. By the way, parenthetically, there's a lot of benefits to Armenia if we can do this too. 
that's a it's a it's a very good location. But you know, if only that mattered as to how hard it is, it would have happened earlier. But unfortunately, this is you need to do this. You need to develop the catalysts. You need to optimize them to work at their maximum efficiency. You have to create reactors that don't exist. You have to create an infrastructure. None of this exists. But if you can do that, by our estimates, you can basically produce the equivalent of a hydrocarbon. So think about making diesel at about $50 a barrel, which is what the market price is today, but won't be for long because it used to be $150 a couple of years ago. You could make it, except you're not taking it from the ground. You're taking CO2 that would be emitted and converting it back into diesel. And that diesel is burned, it makes CO2, then you take CO2 and you make it back into diesel, and it basically becomes a CO2 recycled fuel. If we could do that longer term, we think that is as viable a solution as electric cars are. In fact, it's more viable because a lot of electric cars are being driven on coal-fired electricity. So instead of the CO2 being emitted in the plant, it's being emitted kind of, oh, oh sorry, instead of it being emitted in the car, it's being emitted in a, in, in a plant. Now with solar power, that gets a lot better. So there's very interesting alternatives that we're trying to come up with. So let me skip ahead, and I'm going to do this. I've already told you about all this stuff. There's a bunch of observations, and then I have one last slide that I want to just kind of leave you with. So this, this is way too much to go through, but to, just to summarize a few things, and this is, by the way, parts of this talk are online, so you can see some of these slides if, if you'd like to. One is that, you know, think about this kind of innovation as being, as being done by a crowd, by an ecosystem of people, not by an individual. Uh, I think that unpredictable things are going to benefit from lots of different points of view, and in that regard, that's why we view this as a highly evolutionary process. Think of a mindset, a humble, creative, paranoid optimist. I'd hire that any day. Of course, they're not looking for jobs because they're entrepreneurs, but basically that combination, at least for this kind of entrepreneurship, uh, seems to be pretty interesting. Uh, and the fourth bullet here is worth pointing out. This is going to sound like a statement. That's not, I can't defend it, but you can ask questions. Fail early. One of the things that we as entrepreneurs often do is we don't want to ask the killer question early on. Why? Because it could kill us. And it's kind of preservative not to do that. So you kind of say, well, I could, I'm going to do that a little later, and I'm going to raise some money, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. Then I'm going to get around to that question. But if it turns out that if you value your time and other people's money, if you ask that question early and the answer is no, you can get on to working on something. So if there are really killer questions that speak to the technical viability or the patents, if somebody else has patents all over your space, I would not just kind of duck it and say, well, I'll figure out what I can do. So there's this fail early and don't avoid the killer question part. Strategy, a lot of people pay a lot of money to hire consultants for strategy. I think the most prevalent strategy in startups is just being adaptive. Because I, it's inconceivable that somebody outside your team knows how to build this company, because nobody's built that company before. If you're really working in a brand new area, how are they going to know what you're supposed to do? So the job is on you, and the only way you can figure it out is through this iterative process, but for that you need to stay adaptive. So think of adaptation as kind of your strategy. Again, it might, it might make you unhappy because most people want much better answers to what the strategy should be for winning. I don't have one. I've done this for a long time. And I think that the only way I can tell you is if you, if you fail at losing at the end, that's called winning. So if you could just stay alive and keep looking for value, at some point, value will find you. And, and then you'll, and by the way, one other warning, last, my last kind of warning of this start, is you'll hear lots of people talk about entrepreneurship. I'm sure at AUA you have them every semester. Every startup entrepreneur tells their story. By the way, I didn't tell much of my story for that reason. Not the way it happened. Because if you, if you believe what I showed you and believe what I said to you, which is that it's a messy, clumsy, desperate, iterative, chaotic process, who the hell would come here and give you a talk and tell you that that's what it is? Instead, people go, we were young and we thought the world could be different and then we created a prototype and then somebody... And it becomes like this lovely story. People make movies out of it. I can tell you having talked to thousands of entrepreneurs, literally thousands over all these years, no company that has succeeded in a big way has ever not almost died along the way. And nobody goes around telling people, you know, we did a few things and then it worked out, but I'd like to say it was because of them, but a lot of it was not. And, and, and as long as you know that as a practitioner, you'll also realize not to look for a lot of rationality in what you're doing. Some of the time, you just have to kind of hang on and adapt and keep fine, work close, stay close to customers, stay close to the, even the competitors, because you're searching for what the answer is. 
So the last, 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 last thing I'm going to do is just end on this slide, which is come back all the way to wording. Remember in the beginning I told you entrepreneurship. So I had a few slides about the future. I'm going to skip them, but only to say one thing, which is the reason I wanted to bore you with all this stuff is that I actually think that thousands of these companies later, or tens of thousands, there's, by the way, like 5,000 biotech companies now, and there's probably 50,000 IT companies for all I know. And those numbers are beyond any cottage industry I know. It cannot be that people are going to keep doing this the same way. And I suspect that the big change you're in for, especially if you're students, is that in your lifetime, and I'm trying hard to make it so, this activity will go from being something that kind of people with attention deficit who can't hold down a job do, which is what people used to think what entrepreneurs are, to a profession. So I'm telling you in a highly controversial way, I, my prediction is that there will be professional entrepreneurs in the next generation. And what do I mean by that? So before you throw up or leave, let me tell you, 150 years ago, if there are doctors in the room, there was no medical profession. And people used to go around and kind of bend people's elbows and shoot stuff into their bodies. And one out of 10 people would respond and those people would be knighted. They would be called magicians. And today, of course, if one out of 10 die, they get sued. Uh, what changed? The answer is, yeah, we got better technologies, but they became a profession. People said, we can't just all be wingy and make stuff up and do it. There's a few norms. We can teach each other that. We can agree on a set of things. And then what is a world-class brain surgeon Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, can be really different than a regular mundane brain surgeon, but they're both brain surgeons. I think our society thinks that an entrepreneur is Steve Jobs, and that if you're not Steve Jobs, you're not an entrepreneur. It's completely crazy, completely crazy. So I would argue that what we're going to see over the next period of time, and this has implications for academia in a big way, and I keep arguing with certainly MIT and Harvard where I live, that they should embrace this. It's very counterintuitive, by the way, because these guys feel like they're on top of the world. So they're going, why would I ever concede that this is all going to change and I'm going to lose my advantage? But I'm telling you, as a university that is just getting into this, I would try to figure out what is repeatable, what is learnable. There are ways to learn this. Otherwise, incubators wouldn't be adding value. Otherwise, people who've done this as many times as, for example, my firm has, wouldn't that? But the reality is, I think it's going to change. But so why, why do I say all that? We'll know when it happens when the word changes. Now, I think that's a tall order, so it's probably not going to happen, but I'm going to keep on my crusade. So the, the word entrepreneurship, I'll end saying, is in my view a really bad misnomer. It's a, it's a, bad, it's a bad expression. Here, why, here, why do I say that? So in English, the word ending of words that end in ship, right? So think of what words do you know that end in ship? Anybody? Friendship, leadership. No, that's just, that's a different use of it. But, but, yeah, partnership, mentorship, right? Look at all those words, right? Stewardship. I bet you have never thought about what sh the ending of a word ship really, where, why it's there. And it turns out it's because it's the state of being something, right? So it turns out that if you are something, then you are said to be that. Leadership, you're a leader. Now, I am an engineer, right? I was invited by the engineer school here. People don't say, I do engineership. Why is that? Right? And the answer is because you don't be an engineer, you do engineering. And by the same token, people think that you can't do entrepreneuring, but you are doing entrepreneurship because you are just being who you are. And from there, in my view, comes society's expectation that this is somehow inborn and it's kind of nothing of the sort. So I go around as many places as I can and I cause people to try to use the word entrepreneuring because even though it's as awkward as entrepreneurship, it's not a shorter word, it reminds you that you are meant to be doing something. Whether you're doing it by the first time or eighth time, whether you're doing it following an evolutionary approach or some other approach, the minute you start saying, I'm doing entrepreneuring, I'm not being an entrepreneur, I'm doing entrepreneuring, I think there your expectations will change, the failure rate will change, I think a lot of good things come out of it. So that's my prediction for the future. Um, I didn't have a picture of AUA, so this is MIT, is that the way technological innovation will happen, in my view, in the future, is science and engineering and entrepreneuring and management. By the way, lest you think management is entrepreneuring, it's not. Because by definition, you need to have something to manage, to do management. So when there's nothing, that's not management, I'm sorry. But 
But certainly today, management schools teach entrepreneurship because it's the closest place where people think about business and IP and this and that. But I actually think that long term, when we start thinking about entrepreneuring as a learned, then improved, then practiced in society, where you can kind of give people your own best learnings, that's what I look forward to. I don't know when it'll happen. So thanks for listening, and I'm happy to answer whatever questions you have. On anything, by the way. Yes, in the back. How important do you think fundamental research is in a small country like Armenia for writing, uh, innovation, and entrepreneurship? Um, I think I think it's very important for at least two reasons. One, if you don't do fundamental research, you will not have the scientific knowledge of what is already known in order to engaged selfishly in the process I'm saying should be engaged with in trying new things. And also just the ability to connect what's happening now with what's known already. So you're basically out of the game. If you're not doing fundamental research in any of these fields, you're out of the game, in my view. You are. You might as well not be. You cannot speak the language. That's my personal view. Second, it is a source of the kind of innovation I mentioned on the slide, which is academic innovation, which is you might make inventions that somebody can come along and say, what's the best use of this invention in terms of a product? And that's a form of startups. We do a lot of that. I didn't talk about it today, by the way. But the, the run-of-the-mill conventional startup, where we, that's our bread and butter in my firm, is that. It's not the new way, but that's a very robust way. So I think if the country wants a slew of new startups, having investment in research that is has its application focus is a very important thing. I don't think you can have one without the other. Other questions? Yes, please. Many years ago, I have been told if there is a patent to be made, international patent, that has to be made in Washington, D.C. Otherwise, if you patent a new idea in your country or any other place, then you want to make it international, that wouldn't work. And the guy who was telling me was a retired American Armenian fellow who was here in Armenia, I heard just the opposite. First, you have to make the patent in your country, then you go to the second phase to make it a country patent. Which one is the true story? You just well, I yeah, I'm, I'm I would say I, with the caveat that I'm not. Well, I'm, I, I, we have a lot of patents. We have about 300 patents of flagship that we've been granted. So I do know something about it, but I'm not a patent expert. So you know, make sure you verify this. I think the reason the first person told you that is because a patent <coughs> that you file for in your country is prior art in the US. So in other words, if the patent you file in Armenia is publicly available, and then you go to the patent office in the US, the patent office in the US will reject your patent by saying it was public information made public through your patent in Armenia. So as a result, it is the right advice to file a patent in the US. And for that matter, to file it in Europe, it could be within 12 months of the first filing because it's a confidential filing. In the US, you can make a confidential filing and it will not be public for 18 months. Within the first 12 months, it's advisable to also file in Europe. But the notion that you should file in Armenia and have it public before you file in the US, I can assure you that will ruin the patent in the US because that will be public information. In fact, I'll tell you one other thing. If you file one patent in the US, and then after it's public, you file a second patent, the first patent is prior art to the second patent. You understand what I'm saying? So because a patent has to be novel, unobvious, useful, all properly described, there's a bunch of criteria, one of the novelty features is that somebody has not publicly disclosed something that makes this obvious. Well, if somebody in Armenia filed a patent, it was public, and then you went to the US after it was public and you tried to file a patent, the patent examiner would say it was obvious because it was already made public. Anybody else could have taken that public patent and used that, so you, I can't give you extra rights. I think that's what they might have been telling you, but you should get expert advice. Please.
you know, I, it is a great question. So um, I think it's fair to say that uh, I probably didn't have nearly as much humanities as would have helped me, but I cannot, so therefore it would be silly for me to say it helped me because I didn't have a whole lot of it. I went to engineering undergraduate school, then I went to MIT, and the closest you came to either one of those two humanities were humans around you. There was no other, there was no education. And it was, I think it was a bad thing, because I now have four, four kids, three of whom have gone through college or are going through college, and in several of them who are following science and engineering fields, they have a huge dose of humanities, and it matters a lot. I think it matters in a bunch of different ways. By the way, it should seem ironic to some of you to think that an engineer would put forward the notion that evolution should be the way we think about ideation in startups. Because evolution is not what you learn in engineering school. It's, it's very much kind of comes, it comes from biology, but it's also a, there's a lot of evolutionary thinking that it goes into linguistics, that goes into just generally philosophy, thought processes, a lot of these things. So I think being exposed to things that are out of your field is extremely important because, you know, I think all we do as humans is actually hypothesis to generation. I think any form of creativity starts as a hypothesis, and then when people like it, they become a famous artist. I don't think people know they're famous artists before they do this. And I think they iterate and iterate based on feedback. Same with music. So I think those concepts and being willing to think differently than what you're being taught, taught is a non-STEM concept, I, I would argue, unless they start embracing it. I'll tell while I'm at it, if I can hijack the question, make a couple other points. The other thing that I think adversely selects, and I think in, in science and engineering, this is high, even easier to do than in humanities, for example, and that is that people are graded. And people are graded on being right. Now, if you got anything out of my talk, what I'm telling you is that you should be prepared to be wrong most of the time, because that precedes your being right, if you approach it the way I do, and a lot of other people do. Well, where in your university do you learn how to be wrong and be encouraged and rewarded for it? You don't, especially in science and engineering. Science, at least they teach you the scientific method, which is meant to kind of encourage that kind of hypothesis driven science. But I would say there also has to be the exposure to the notion that there is no absolute right or wrong and that in the idea space, you've got to try different approaches. So I think also kind of there's attitude things that, that we can do a lot better. At, at a lot. Like I mentioned earlier, learn how to be silly. Again, I'll, I'll tell you, come see Patch Adams. Learn how to be silly. Learn how to make a fool of yourself and feel good about the fact that you made a fool of yourself. Do that in school a few times, unless you get bad grades and you flunk out. And guess what? You're a lot better prepared for a life in innovation than you would be if you tried to be right all the time. Because how can you possibly be right in something that's never been done before? I don't know. Luck, basically. That's the only trait that I think you can correlate with that. It's just simply not possible. So you might as well be, you know, artists, Gloria, people say poor artists, you know, they're always going to be poor, right? Well, a poor artist is the de facto state. And you might be trying to defy it, but if that gets you down, don't be an artist. Right? Well, it's not different as an entrepreneur and an innovator. Right? If you really think that your idea is supposed to be right, I think you're kidding yourself. That's, that's, at least that's the experience that, that I've seen. Absolutely right. I mean, I squeezed in a much longer talk into a shorter one because I figured it's my moment. But uh, I didn't talk about the importance of teams, and I didn't talk about the importance of some of the commercialization challenges, and there are many. And it is the case, and anybody who talked in this field will tell you that you know, a lot of times, experientially, B ideas and A teams will do better than A ideas and B teams. That is, that is a truism that people keep repeating, and it, maybe that's how it became a truism, but it's just definitely the case. So, People, the people dimension. Well, on that front, getting different-minded people, getting you know, leadership is tough. By the way, if you're trying to lead, you know, it's like these things, I guess, like wars must be like this. If, you've, if you're fighting a war where another war has been fought, you have something to go on. If you're fighting a war where nobody's ever fought a war, you don't really know the terrain, it must be a different form of leadership when you've got to get people to be willing to follow your lead and likely die because you have no idea what you're doing except you've got to lead them anyway because you might, you, you're trying to win the war. I think that skill and that combination of humility and courage, but it takes a lot of courage, I'm telling you. It takes a lot of courage masked by confidence uh, to prevail and to lead in this space. And that 
that is not easy. I mean, that's another thing that I think people can really think about, practice in different settings, to try to get themselves into the mindset. So I think that's important. Commercialization, it's a whole, it's a longer topic. I mean, that's very specific to the field. But indeed, maybe I should have, didn't emphasize enough. Your job as an entrepreneur is to imagine value, then demonstrate value, then create that value, and get rewarded for creating that value. Along the way, you need resources, and then a lot of other characteristics to make to go all the way to the end. Value is hard to assess, hard to generate. That's where the commercialization challenge is. Once somebody's done that, guess what? Large companies are really good at doing it again and again and again. And they'll do it better, and they'll do it cheaper. If you want efficiency, that's that's the large company game. But in the small company game, I think you're gonna have to figure it all out. So there's a value orientation is a key part of innovation commercialization. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Afeya. It's what you said is absolutely real and true. You've given us a very, very good introduction to entrepreneurship, entrepreneuring. Um, I taught at five, six universities abroad. I came to AUA because I believed in the uh, in the brain power of Armenian youth. And I teach creativity, technological innovation, leading to entrepreneurship. And uh, I think our students, our youth, are so bright, so creative in their thinking. So entrepreneurship is the way for Armenia. However, we need to educate uh, our youth. And uh, so my question to you as an expert, and you're a very experienced person, would, are you willing, or what avenues do you see for uh, our youth? If they have given the, the status or situation at AUA where we have no laboratories, science laboratories in any kind, um, can you put your venture money as seed to make at least some of the ideas that the student give, whether they are social problems, scientific problems, and uh, or political problems, to bring it to a fruition. Thank you. So thank you. So there's a, a few different things that you you said. I I would say that if if the question is how does AUA do it? I need to know a lot more about AUA and its specifics. If the question is, uh, there's a lack of funding in general, and you know how does funding come about for these projects? I think fund funding comes about for these projects when somebody actually puts together one an appreciation of what the specific projects are that require the funding to just get a sense of the number of these, and then actually have a seed. I'm not sure I understood it, but I'm happy. I'm happy if you want to talk afterwards. I'm happy yes. to tell you specifically because I'm not. Okay, later, later. Am I willing personally? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. So, well, yeah, I'm happy to. I'm doing a lot of philanthropy here. I'm also involved in commercial projects here. My firm is in the United States. It, it invests in biotechnology. And while I have a lot of connections in that field, never I can certainly collaborate with people. My firm doesn't invest as a firm in Armenia. I can personally, and I do. So that's that's so we should separate. And in this field, you should understand that kind of professional. It's a little bit like banking. There are relatively few banks that will be in the U.S. and will be. In, but there are some global. But in my case, you know, just so you know, we've been involved in 85 companies. 70 of them are within walking distance from my office. That's how bad it is. And that's just a luxury we have because we're in Cambridge. And we've done some countries, some companies outside, and we'd be open to technologies that are in any way in the world. But I think what you're talking about is more, how does one do this more personally, or is there an opportunity to create some kind of a seed fund here? That's something we can discuss. Yes. Okay.
know, uh, it's a good question. And it's one of the things that we've been talking about doing is actually coming back and objectively trying to assess where, where we have reached and why. Uh, because I don't, you know, it's impressionistic things and gut level things in this space could be misleading. I could tell you that I think for a number of years, based on the growth in the country leading up to 2008, 2009, we certainly were, you know, the, the, the tiger of the Caucasus. We wrote back, you know, published a book with that title, as you may, as you may know. And, and it was singularly the fastest growing space in a country of this kind for many years. Obviously, after 2009, things changed pretty dramatically, so these externalities kicked in. I don't think that we've recovered quite from that, and it had lots of shocks in the country. I think in terms of the political system, openness to developing competitiveness, it's been a mixed bag. I think that's objectively the case. Um, I am highly encouraged by the progress in the IT sector, and I think that if we could make that, I mean, I visited Synopsys this morning, and I haven't seen it for many, many, many years, and it's early incarnation, I've seen it. And, you know, if you could make, uh, as was described, kind of a country out of that island in the IT sector, uh, you, you've gone someplace. One of the other things, guys, you may remember, and actually I bring it back to the discussion on innovation for all it's worth, and I'm, I'm a, a, an admitted kind of uh, idealist in this regard, but I think I'd, I'd urge you to think about it this way. We used to talk a lot during Armenia 2020 that one of the challenges in the country, which is kind of the loss of talent, immigration of people out of Armenia, that if you think about that as a normal process, what is it that causes people to immigrate? I would argue simplistically the perception that in the place they're going to, they have a better life than the life they have here. But actually development is just immigration in time. It's not in space, it's in time. And if you get people to be able to conceive of a common destination that can be here, but that is a better place, then they can work towards immigration in time without having to move out. And by the way, any of you who move to another country will also know that that's no easy thing. You don't know the language, you don't know the laws, you get treated as an outcast, lots and lots of things. But immigration in time, at least in, in the country, I think that remains the objective. But obviously, you know, there's there, there's a lot of there's a lot of challenges, and we identify a lot of those challenges, and I think they continue. Can I say that this is like we're on track to Singapore? No. Now, can I say that you know the EU ch uh, scenario we talked about? I gave a talk here. I remember at some length about the four scenarios. Obviously, the EU has no more wanted us in their EU than we've been able to get into their EU, but certainly they've shown some openness. The Russian scenario, I think, has been probably a little bit of a, of a giant pulling force. You know, so that's been, there was one scenario, by the way, those of you who have no idea what we're talking about, there were four scenarios developed. There was a Singapore one, an EU one, one called Russia with, from Russia with Love, which basically was a closer to Russia. Back in 10 years ago, the economy was nowhere near as close to Russia as it is now, by, by default, I think, and by actual needs. And then there was one that was kind of the Syrian scenario, which was basically militarization and continued conflicts, and that driving the essence of the country. I think we've actually done better than that. In my objective judgment, I think we've done better than that. But it is a hybrid, and I, I think going forward, we have a lot of work to do. I'll also remind people, just because Gary threw me a softball, as they say in the States, where it's easy to hit one. Uh, I, think that, I think that everybody who's an entrepreneur in this room and an innovator in this room has to, on the one hand, do this for financial gain, on the other hand, do it to improve the field they work in, but also use their talents, develop talents, to help develop Armenia. Because it turns out that immigrating in time is the job of entrepreneurs and innovators. Because that's all innovation is. Think about what, what does an innovator do? They take the current status quo, they say, I really hate this, and they come up with a new one, you know, an iPhone, whatever. And what is that? That's just also a form of immigration. It's immigration in the device world from a one type of folk to another. So if you think about innovation, immigration, and development as common concepts, there's differences, but in common concepts, I think you'll find that you have a special role as an entrepreneur and innovator in development, just as important as any regulator or any World Bank or any financial development approach. I would like you at least to think about that. That's the only reason I got involved in this. That's the only reason my good friend Ruben Martanian got involved in this was because of that, was that we were both entrepreneurs and we thought, who's gonna do, who's gonna care about this more and be willing to be wrong as many times as we are because that's what we do for a living. Other questions, yes, in the back. At, no, it's you, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, my question is kind of rather bio question, so I'll put 
disrupting the human genome project, a lot of uh, countries underweight their national genome project. Or what do you think whether like Armenian genome project would be kind of benefit for Armenia? Not from the basic science point of view, but kind of commercial or, or, or something. Uh, look, it's an interesting question. I mean, as you know, Iceland, of all places, and also um, Estonia, have national databases. They have sequences of everybody, and they follow the health of everybody. That might be a little harder to do here, because the healthcare system needs to be of a certain state where it's all electronic, and so it's easy to help manage everybody's healthcare. But I think that if you, if, you could do it, if you could do the genome sequence and the healthcare, electronic maintenance, then there's value to be created, because this is a small, relatively homogeneous population. And genetically, we're not that divergent from each other, which it turns out from an experiment standpoint is a good thing. From, from a worldliness standpoint, maybe not so much, but experimentally, we're probably a good cohort. For those of you who are in the genetics field, by the way, another really, really interesting thing somebody should follow is very recently there was a paper showing the what's called epigenetic changes. Now, those are some of you are going to cringe here, but I'll tell you anyway. It turns out that your DNA is not static. We all thought your DNA is the same. You get it from your ma mother and your father, and that's it. Well, it turns out that there's a lot of sophistication in that your genome has certain changes to it that are done during a lifetime, and that's called epigenetics, right? You might say, why does this matter? I'm going to tell you why, this, why you should care. It turns out that the epigenetic changes in people correlate with trauma. And people have shown, for example, that survivors from wars two generations later, have genetically imprinted changes in their DNA. Not mutations, but absolutely handed down epigenetic changes, which I bet you anything in Armenians, if, if that paper that just came out in Science or Nature, I forget, very well done study, would be interesting to study. I don't want to take us back to our survivor and, and genocide issues, but I can tell you this, from a scientific curiosity standpoint, I don't know why you wouldn't go there. <laughs> Everything. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I would say, uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of things. I mean, one of the things, maybe, maybe I'll answer the question in this way. One, I wish I knew a lot more. I didn't get any of these mindsets. I did not think of what I'm doing as this kind of discovery journey. And val I didn't know anything about value coming out of an engineering school. I mean, I knew something, but I could do economic analyses of old things. I couldn't do economic analysis of non-existent things. There's a, lot of, there's a lot more things I could have learned, I wish I learned, and I hope they teach now. That's one thing. The other thing, though, I would say is that the, if you ask me a slightly different question, which is what did I learn in college that has helped me the most? And I would say that, that question is easy to answer, which is as simple as learning how to learn. And it really, really is the case that because technology changes so fast, if you are working at the edge of any field, it turns out that the experts know very little more than you do because they just found out a little while ago. But if you can learn quickly, you can keep up with them and beat them in any area. But if you don't know how to learn and you go by what you learned 20 years ago, then you better work at really the middle of the field because it's very nice and comfortable there, but you're not gonna do well at the edge. So that's something that I learned kind of along the way that has helped advance. I think we're out of time, so I, I'm happy to ask, talk to people a little bit afterwards. But, May I have uh, the last question? It's up to no? the... Yes, okay, why don't we ask... ask, ask yes. One more. One quick question, please. Um, my name is Guhar Gilumian, I work for the World Bank, and I'm very glad to, you, you've mentioned the uh, economic report we produced about 10 years ago. But um, uh, I'd like to know whether uh, you are aware of the latest report we produced two years ago, where we proposed that um, uh, our vision about Armenia's future development model, which we see um, uh, around diaspora institutions, uh, diaspora sponsors institu institutions, one of which is um, establishing a venture capital. Uh, um, I like to second the professor's opinion, not just uh, um, one or a personalized uh, uh, scheme, but a more sustainable institutional scheme. 
uh, diaspora nurtured uh, um, venture capital to be established and uh, promoted? How do you see this model working in Armenia? You know, I, I have not uh, researched it when we were doing a lot of this stuff here. The topic came up multiple times before. Um, and I look, I'm, if there's a serious effort to establish something, certainly people like me and there's many others in the diaspora who work in venture capital would be happy to, willing to sit down. I worry, however, that the people may not like what we have to say because we're not going to say what the reports say. We're going to say how hard it is and what's required. But I'm more than happy to, to engage. And by the way, I've met with the World Bank expert that was hired from Israel to help give this advice. And I told him a year and a half ago that I'm more than happy to talk to him and he never called me again. So I, I invite you. I invite you. No, no, not you, not you. I was very clear. I invite you. You know, this topic has come up a bunch of times. I think people would like for this to exist, but how to create it, there's a lot of ways to do it wrong. At a minimum, I could probably help you figure out how to do it wrong. I don't know if I can help you do it right, but there's a whole lot of things that I think would not work, and I worry a lot that people will falsely conclude it can't be done if it's done not in the right way. So I'm keenly interested in being able to collaborate, at least that way, maybe more. Thank you very much. As you can see, you have to come back. We could go on asking questions. This was a fascinating talk. I learned a lot. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, we have a couple of gifts for you. Uh, this is a book, uh, a personal book. I, it's about my father. I wrote it. He uh, was an artist. Uh, we wanted to give you something from AUA. And uh, we have t shirts. We did not the size, <laughs> so we decided a, a large and an extra large. So one of those was yeah, really even more. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you for coming.